So that's tomorrow night, Wednesday, the February 7th, 6.30 p.m. in 105 Northgate, which is a very nice room. Um, I sent you so many announcements. I hope you got them. And let me suggest that if you are auditing or for some reason you're not getting CourseWeb announcements, please send me your email and I can add it to the CC list and make sure that you get some of these things. Okay? And Michael, could I speak to you just for a second right after class? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. uh, of all the people who are coming to speak here, I wanted to say in general, you know, you, you, I gave you this list of the four speakers who were lined up and we probably will have more of them. A very fortunate thing seems to be happening such that they'll be coming here right after being out there in the field. Like when David Hartso, for example, want him to talk about nonviolent peace force, their main project, our main project, I'm actually part of that organization, is in Sri Lanka right now. And he, David, is going to Sri Lanka next week and will be there for two weeks before he comes back and talks to us. So these are people who will come in uh, right off the front lines. And in that connection, the end of the month, I think Wednesday, February 28th, there's going to be a presentation by two people who are participating in one of the most intense – I don't know exactly what word to use here, but this is a, a situation where the rubber is really meeting the road. It's where the Israeli government wants to build this famous separation wall of theirs right there through this town, it's going to destroy this little <laughs> village called Bilin. And people have been nonviolently blocking that construction day after day after day for more than uh, a year. I think it's like 18 months, maybe two years. And two people, a man and a woman, one from Bilin and one from Hebron, which is if there's any place more violent than Bilin, it's Hebron. They are actually going to be here on campus Wednesday the 28th. I asked them if they could come to our class and they can't. I threatened to go on a hunger strike. They said they didn't care. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding about that part. <laughs> uh, but they did say that what they would like to do is get together with us before the talk. So the talk is at 7. We could have some kind of reception with them at 5. So in principle, just so I can get back to them, how many of you would be interested in getting together with these people, say, some kind of reception at 5 o'clock on Wednesday, February 28th? Okay, okay, okay. Why am I not surprised? Okay, great. I'll pass that on. Very good. Well, um, just to recap a little bit what we were doing last time, we had just started discussing a very interesting point, which is intervention, how to do it, uh, what are the problems to avoid, and how do those problems intersect with basic nonviolent principles. And I want to back up a step on that. Remember we were talking about peace imperialism being one extreme where you go in and say, okay, you people can't control yourselves, but, but we have peace, here it is. And you ignore all of their indigenous traditions and the advantages and disadvantages. That's very much underappreciated. And there are cases on record of <coughs> interventions that were attempted and ended up being more harm than good. And one of them was in the Balkans, as a matter of fact, during the, the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, the other extreme is to ignore them. And then they, they basically don't thrive. They, they collapse. And so you have things like the uprisings in Pakistan in 1972. They got no support from the international community. They went nowhere. Now this is one of those places where Pax 164B is a little different from Pax 164A. Because right? Pax 164A, we talk about the theory and everything is uh, squeaky clean in Pax 164A. Pax 164A, you never tell a lie <coughs> and, except the professor, he, he lies all the time. And you rely totally – on person power and you're not even interested in numbers. So 1942, Gandhi wants to still have Satyagraha but he doesn't want to em embarrass the British. Just to remember the principle of non-embarrassment. They're slightly preoccupied fighting World War II. They get very excited about that sort of thing. 
And so there's no point in carrying on a satyagraha with them. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to lose the momentum. He appoints one person to be a satyagrahi. So, um, gosh, that was very interesting, but I'm sort of forgetting the connection of what – why was I talking about this? You better shut down the cameras for a couple of minutes. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, the principle of non-embarrassment uh, connects up with uh, the question of appropriate intervention. The other principle that comes up in this connection, which I'm surprised I forgot to mention on Thursday, is a very important Gandhian principle called Svadeshi. And does somebody want to define for us very quickly what Svadeshi means? Yeah, Zoe? Yeah, very good. So you should solve problems that are closer to you before you go on and try to intervene in problems that are at a distance. And this has even a psychological interpretation where you should try to overcome your own difficulties and work with your own strengths before you reach out to other people. Now, before is sometimes not to be taken too literally. But there is a balance that we have to strike between strict Swadeshi and what the French call the droit d'ingérence or the right to intervene in cases when human rights violations reach a certain level, all humanity is involved. So if we stand around while stuff is going on in Darfur or Rwanda or the Balkans and have nothing to do with it, that is from a Gandhian perspective uh, an act of cowardice which is basically the most extreme form of violence. So there's actually an imperative – I'm not using the term moral, but there's an imperative to intervene in some cases. But what does that do to the concept of Swadeshi where the people on the ground are supposed to be doing this themselves? So again – hang on one second, Zoe. Again, we see that the ideal – you never tell a lie. You only need one person. You never intervene. Do it all yourself. That's – you know, sort of the Euclidean ideal that we're striving for. But in the real world, there are compromises that we have to make to continue. So, Zoe, what was your question? W what, what was? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, this came up in the context of third party intervention. And the word to intervene is ingérer in French, and ingérence is uh, intervention. And some French internationalists coined this concept, droit d'ingérence, which means – sorry – which means uh, the right to intervene. So we're going to have to get back to this when we talk about globalization and globalism because it's the whole – idea that's involved here is the breakup of na the nation-state entity with its absolute sovereignty. So again, the idea is if you have something going on like Rwanda, just to take an obvious extreme case, people are being massacred and uh, be because you are a human being, you cannot stand <laughs> beside and say, this doesn't involve me. Right? If a, a failure of justice anywhere is uh, – injustice anywhere is a damage of justice everywhere, as Martin Luther King said. So you want to intervene. So let's say the Hutu interim Hamwe militia stands there and says, this is our country. You have no right to invade us. But this, uh, this principle said that you actually cannot prevent a third party from intervening just because of national sovereignty if your own national sovereignty has broken down to the point where you cannot protect the basic life of people in your state. So it's an extremely interesting principle which they're trying to get past. And I, I happen to know that there's a large group working on this internationally where they're trying to create what they're calling a non-ignorable consensus that when state control breaks down too badly, 
it, there is the you cannot ask other people not to come in and fix it. Yeah. How? Droit d'ingérence means the right of intervention. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I came in here this morning feeling the way I usually feel in the thirteenth week of the semester, which is, oh, how are we going to get all of this covered? And now matters have gotten even worse. But that's all right, as long as they're interesting. Okay. So um, we were talking about this very delicate sometimes balance where you have to go in and provide, at the very least, some kind of uh, solidarity and witnessing and possibly even direct intervention going on up the scale to reaching the point what we call interposition, where you stand between two armies and say, we're not going to let you do this. And you have seen in a funny way an example of this, although it wasn't international. Remember, where have you seen third party nonviolent interposition happening in a very dramatic way. Well, I'll give you a hint. It was in the, in the do documentary that we just saw, where it was hatred. Yeah, Sid? Okay. Right. That was the famous EDSA rebellion. EDSA being the acronym of a uh, street intersection in Manila. <laughs> it's extremely interesting because you had two sections of the armed forces one which had defected and one which was loyal to, quote, President, unquote, Marcos. And uh, they were about to have at one another. And people, just men, women, and children with a lot of religious prominently, people baking bread, and handing out coffee and stuff, they got in between those two forces. So that Marcos is sending soldiers against these uh, people in this camp, Camp Baker, I forget what the name of the camp was, and the people prevented them from doing that. And that's why you had that very dramatic interchange where somebody in the street asks someone up in an armored troop carrier what's happening. And he said, my commander will tell you. I'm not sure you heard all this because the soundtrack was not too great. The commander leans down and they say, what's happening? And he says, the war is over. And so when you hear the war is over, what's your next question? You come from a win-lose culture. Naturally, you're going to say, who won? And he said, the Philippine people. So that gives us the whole concept of people power being above this uh, f factioning into forces. Uh, in, in many of the events that we'll be looking at, there's like an iconic story, which is perhaps a helpful way to remember and encapsulate the meaning of the event. And the iconic story for Edsa was when a fighter pilot was sent out to bomb the intersection where the people were assembling. And you read about 90 percent of this story is in Zunes, Kurtz, and Asher. Uh, this pilot goes out there and he levels off. It shows you why being to able to see your enemy, your victims, at least in a bomb site is better than sitting in front of a computer terminal and pushing buttons which is why the military wants to go more and more to computer terminals. But here's this pilot. He levels out to, I don't know, fire his rockets or whatever he's going to fire. And he looks down and he sees the ETSA intersection. And of course, being a Filipino, he's a devout Christian. And he sees it's like this huge cross made up of people. And he said, I, was, I went into such a state of shock that I could feel the helmet moving back on my head from the hair standing up on the back of his neck. And he turned the plane around and landed it and turned himself over to the revolutionary uh, forces. So that is a very good example of the power of nonviolence. And from my point of view, it's a very good example of correct use of symbols. I'm kind of um, in some ways, I'm the least popular person in the entire nonviolent movement. And that's because I really don't believe in symbols, symbolic action. And we could talk more about you know, my reasons for this. You put me on sodium amytal or something and get me to really divulge you. Know, I was beaten up by a symbol when I was in high school or something like that, whatever 
whatever my problem is. But to be a little bit more serious, it has to do with the fact that the strength of nonviolence comes from its contact with reality, not from symbols. Anyway, this was a very powerful symbol. But why – some of you may have heard me say this and some of you maybe can guess – why does it not bother me? Why – here you have Nagler who's this famous symbol Nazi who hates symbolism. Why is it that he likes this particular episode? Yeah, Alex. Well, it's really the only thing that gives me so much of a concrete act. Yes. Symbolic yes. It was a concrete act with symbolic resonance rather than a symbolic act with no concrete backing. And what proves it in this case was they did not know that they were in the shape of a cross. It was not like who the people who do these calendars who are called the Bear Truth or something like that where they have people in a rather unusual state of dress lying down and spelling out peace and things like this. But these people did not know. They were not consciously aware that they were using this. Like, go for the reality and the symbol will take care of itself. It doesn't mean you pay absolutely no attention to symbols. But it's better not to get hung up on them. Okay. So that was, that was where we were at last time and I kind of expanded on that a little bit. Um, before I get back into our readings in some of these episodes, there were a few things that I noticed over the weekend that I want to share with you. Want to share with you is a euphemism. Whenever something bothers me, I have no way to get it off my chest. I use you people. I, I hope you don't mind. It's a very valuable service you're providing. Uh, but one thing that struck me was there seems to be a debate going on in Congress right now. It's not the only debate. The central debate is about how many more troops to give President Bush. How big of a surge are we going to have? I was forcibly reminded of a book by a very uh, – a really brilliant political scientist by the name of uh, Stress – not Stress, no, something like that who, – who wrote a book called Why People Go to War. And he looked at the Japanese decision to – Stessinger. Thank you, Carrie. John Stessinger. It is a brilliant book, don't you agree? And he talks about why the ja – how the Japanese decided to attack Pearl Harbor. They had a cabinet meeting and even though there was an emperor, he had a cabinet and they met. And at this cabinet meeting, the non-war faction said, we have been bogged down in China for three and a half years. How do you expect us to conquer the United States? He was – they were furious. The meeting was adjourned. The meeting was reconvened about a month later and the, the agenda for the new meeting was should we do it on December 7th or December 21st, something like that. So this is a funny way that people manipulate their own consciousness when they've made a bad decision which they cannot justify. Instead of saying, okay, we made a bad decision, let's just go along with it or something honest like that, they get buried in the details and they cannot back up again and see the big picture and really face what they've considered. So I know that you've heard me say several times that I have certain disagreements with the way political science is taught as a discipline. But here's a case where if everybody in the country would read Why Nations Go to War by John Stessinger, we would maybe be much better off in Congress right now. One more that I want to quote, share with you and thank you very much. This is very therapeutic for me. Uh, in Gaza, you're having an incipient third-party interposition movement being talked about. That's because these two factions, Hamas and Fatah, are at one another's throats and obviously the Palestinians are very unhappy with this because their whole thing has been that they're united against the occupation and now they're fighting one another. It's clearly the obvious way to lose. So it has been proposed that ordinary citizens should like surround Abu Mazen's house and you know, Fatah offices and things like that so that fighters from the other side can't attack them. And I have no problem with this but I do have a problem with the terminology because these people are being referred to as human shields.
And first of all, again, thank you for just letting me vent here for a while. First of all, I, I think this term is dehumanizing and I don't like it to start with. The human being is not a shield. You know, a shield is supposed to protect the human being, not the other way around. Second of all, and more concretely, the reason I really dislike this term is that it's used of two different groups of people which from the nonviolent point of view are as different as black and white. And that again confuses our whole project here. Here we are, you know, coming here twice a week trying to catch up with the reading. I know <laughs> it's very difficult. I'm going to be thinking about how to help you out there. Um, working so hard to get this message clear and journalists out there are using the term human shields for people like citizens of Gaza who may end up doing this. Maybe they're doing it right now. And people who are forced at gunpoint <laughs> to interpose themselves in front of uh, an armed unit. Uh, this is a practice which has been carried on here and there. When our armies get desperate, they grab hold of children or women or something like that. You know, professors, somebody is just really helpless and vulnerable. And they put them out in front and force them to be there and say, if you shoot, ha ha, you're going to have to shoot these people. So now do you see why I'm saying that these two things, though they seem similar, are polar opposites and it's a very bad idea to confuse, uh, overlook the distinction? Anybody help me out here? Why was I so upset about this? Catherine? Uh-huh. Voluntarily. Yeah. Yes. So from the point of view of the world, as I say, people who don't take Pax 164, unfortunately still in the majority, <coughs> the important thing is behavior. And because you're standing there in between two people, camps of people who have guns, you're doing the same thing. Whereas from our point of view, the important thing is volition and a word that's more frequently used, intention. Real third-party nonviolent interveners are saying, we're not for this side or that side, we're for peace. We are here representing that higher order unity which you people are obscuring with your polar factionalism. Whereas human shields are just you know, human beings being used as objects against their will. So I'm sort of getting into contest mode. I've had the idea recently that we should have a world flag and a contest to come up with a better term than nonviolence. Maybe you should get involved in that, Jenna. Carrie, you do the flag. Jenna, you do the, the word. Uh, and maybe we should have a contest to think of a term that would first of all be less dehumanizing and second of all which would – show us the difference between people who volunteer for peace and people who are forced to act as targets in war. But at the very least, you can see why there isn't a whole lot of understanding about nonviolence out there. It's because people don't even have a vocabulary to describe it in. Okay? Yes, Stacia. Actually, yeah, that's a good – I don't actually think that the wrong kind of human shields where people are forced to do it has actually happened in the Mideast. It's happened elsewhere. I uh, can't think of an example offhand. But there were several conflicts recently in which <laughs> civilians were forced – or, you know, it, it gets to be a kind of a blurry line sometimes where you have people – you know, go like, oh, well, I remember in Iraq, the Iraqi army or in uh, – here's the example I was really trying to think of, Lebanon, where you had um, Hezbollah, which is very similar to Hamas in a way because they do civil service for people who have no uh, infrastructure. But then they also use violence against the uh, external aggressor. So you had Hezbollah going and setting up bases in apartment houses. 
So in order for the Israelis to take them out, they had to blow up that apartment house, you know, kill 300 people, which unfortunately they actually went and did it. So that's complicating the stuff. But I don't think it's actually happening yet in either case, in either definition in Gaza. All right. Well, uh, time is hemorrhaging. I've got to get on to some of the things we've been studying. As I told you in my second and more frantic course web announcement, I do want to talk a little bit about Section 2 in Zunas, Kurtz, and Asher before we go on to the Europe part. And again, what I'm doing here is a little bit arbitrary in the sense that I'm talking about only the insurrectionary movements. And there are some movements which start out as anti-militarist reforms or some kind of other less ambitious reform. And they discover that this isn't going to go away unless we overthrow the whole regime. <coughs> and you could argue that the, the example, the big paradigm that we always think of, uh, the freedom struggle in India, the biggest and best of everything in our field, that that was like that, that Gandhi started out asking for the rights of uh, Indian workers in South Africa and eventually he, he, he got to quit India. He said, get out of here. We have to bring down the whole regime. Um, and it would be very interesting to know. I would actually give up something that I treasure, not necessarily money but something more affordable. Uh, to know when it dawned on Gandhi that he was really going against the British Raj, not to mention Western civilization, colonialism, and all of that stuff. It would be interesting to know. So my distinction here is a little bit arbitrary, but for the time being, for simplicity's sake, we're sticking with uh, uprisings that aim at overthrows of regimes. And I wanted to say a little bit about the Iranian Revolution, uh, 1978. Uh, it's interesting that both Iran and Chile are attempts to overthrow regimes which our country had put in power. In the case of Iran, it was 1953. British and American and Israeli intelligence cooperated the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh, who was a very popular uh, leader, and put the Shah in power, who actually was not a Shah. I mean, if you did the DNA, I'm sure you could prove that he was not a descendant of Cyrus the Great, or whoever he claimed to be. But he was just a strong man and he set up, again, with the cooperation of Israeli intelligence. Almost makes you think there might be a law of karma in the universe considering how grave a danger to Israel Iran is now. But with the help of Mossad, they set up this Savak and they carried out this horrendous repressive regime. Now, there is a mention in the description of this by Zunas, Kurtz, and Asher of, an, of the fact that in many cases, soldiers who were sent out to fire on these crowds defected. So it's like on the field, people realize what they're doing. They remember in the film about Ed said they're going to come out here and they're going to see their sisters, their brothers, their, their relatives are on the other side. They won't shoot. So this is a phenomenon which you can employ if you, if you know about it. You can sometimes manipulate to get people to see the humanity of their attended victims. Uh, this actually had a powerful effect up to a point in both the Prague Spring uprising of 1968 and the Tiananmen uh, uprising which became a massacre in uh, I guess it was 84. And that is you had soldiers who would come in and people would fraternize with them. Of course, nowadays you'd have to also sororize with them because there'd be some lady soldiers and say, you know, wh what are you doing here? You know, we're revolutionists just like you. And once you make that human contact, they can't really bring themselves to kill you anymore. And what they did in both these cases in Prague and later in China was to send in special units who were from such a distant part of the country that they didn't even have a common language with the people who were in the uprising. But none of that is directly relevant in Iran. Uh, but what is relevant is that soldiers would be ordered to you know, take 
out, take control of these squares. They would go there and they'd see these people who were just Iranians like them and they would defect. Now what they don't – what uh, Zunas, Kurtz, and Asher don't go on to tell you, partly because it's not very well documented, okay? So I have to tell you this right up front. This is a little bit anecdotal. I've been spending decades trying to track it down. I can't quite get to something that a, a journalist would say, okay, this is news. I'm going to trot over to Northgate Hall and publish this. But if you, even if it didn't happen, it's a good myth. A good myth is something that never happened but is always true. Okay, I didn't make up that definition, by the way. So if, even if it didn't happen, but I think at least the two-thirds of it did happen, then uh, it at least shows us something about the inner dynamics of nonviolence. It could happen. So the next step that I want to take is that in one case – and this is pretty well documented – one of these soldiers, when he saw what he was doing and he saw that he had no other way out of it, he shot his commanding officer. This is known in Vietnam as fragging, very serious business. There's recently been a film about it called Sir, No Sir, about the defection of American troops in Vietnam, which was millions of times greater than we were given to understand. Somehow this is even before they embedded the journalists in the military. I said they were in bed with the military before they got embedded in the military. Okay. <laughs> not, not, not a good joke. Okay. Mo move on from here. So this soldier uh, shot his commanding officer and then turned his rifle on himself. That much is pretty documented. The anecdotal part I don't have terribly good evidence for is about what happened in the lead up to that episode. It was a demonstration. There were thousands and thousands of people in the square in Tehran. And by having a rally in the square, those people were undertaking a terrific risk because the Shah did not stop at sending helicopters over the square and machine gunning people. They knew very well that they might be killed. So we're in stage three, way up on the curve. And this particular demonstration was being addressed by mullahs, by, by Islamic priests. And it was a mullah who was up there speaking. And the, this uh, squad, uh, company leader or whoever it was ordered him shot and they shot him. So they shot this priest right in front of all of these people. It's like you know, the assassination of Romero. And s here's the shocker. After this man fell, another mullah stepped up to the microphone and said, where my brother has fallen, I will carry on. Stood there looking at those soldiers and launched back into the talk. And guess what? He was shot. And he fell and guess what? A third mullah stood up and said in the same language, where my brother has fallen, I will go on. At that point a shot rang out and that's when this soldier killed his commanding officer. And then he killed himself and then the, the troops dispersed. So that was rather a heavy story for only 10, 15 in the morning. <laughs> I hope you're all you know, fully able to roll with this. but. Now, do you remember, perchance, some of you who were uh, with us last semester, do you remember something that Gandhi said in connection with the other type of nonviolence in use against armed conflict, namely civilian-based defense? Where he was describing in Switzerland what he called the Thermopylae uh, – operation or something like that where let's say the, what, the, what they were worried about at that time was a Japanese invasion, okay? And he wanted to come up with an alternative for the British plan which was very predictable. You know, stay there and fight to the last soldier. Actually, the British plan was to get out of India immediately the minute the Japanese invaded but nobody knew that at that time. I think it's very interesting. Nobody knew it. But they were challenging Gandhi and saying, what would you do? You're a nonviolent person. You don't even do ambulance corps anymore. How would you defend your country? With the implication being if you can't come up with a plan, nonviolence is no good and we have to have armies and so forth. 
which of course is totally illogical because they didn't know they were way up on the curve and all. Okay, everybody's very ignorant. <laughs> we know this. We don't hate them. We don't despise them. We pity them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> here you are. Gandhi had to come up with a plan and he said, men, women, and children walk to the border and stand there. And they said, but, but, but the Japanese will massacre them. And then what did he say? Do you remember, Amy? Yeah, that's right. His exact language was, and any army which advanced over the dead bodies of men, unarmed men, women, and children would find itself unable to repeat the experiment. So this episode in Tehran uh, is a good example of that. Yes, you can stand there and you can kill innocent, non-resisting people if you've been dehumanized enough. But where I want to go with this is to say that nobody, practically nobody, can be dehumanized completely. There is no way to totally eradicate that spark of human empathy within every human being. So if it's been buried very deeply, you'll have to suffer a lot to awaken it. If it's only been slightly buried, you don't have to suffer as much. Depends when you start and so on. R.B.? Oh, it was very close to the end. Yet it, once he started massacring hordes of innocent people, it, it, was, it was getting close to the end. Even though the then president of the U.S., who was you know, not the war president, he was the prayer breakfast president, uh, Jimmy Carter said, the Shah of Iran is our best friend in the Middle East. Yeah, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's it's just a matter of degree, I think, Matt. And it's also the way they've been massacring them. I, I I would have to say that in the case of some of those people in those tribal conflicts in sub Saharan Africa who have been brought in as soldiers when they were like fourteen year old kids, boys and girls. That's probably the deepest grade of dehumanization that we've got to deal with. It's, it's very, very deep. But, and I'm, I'm standing here and saying I mean, my belief, I've got no way to prove it. My belief is that there'd be a way to reach even those people. There would be a way. But the cost would be horrendous, of course. So this, this is why in the, in the course of making someone into a soldier, you have to dehumanize that person. And you forget that this is, this is exactly the way, non the way violence always <laughs> operates. You sacrifice the future for the present. So now you have these people coming back. 550,000 GIs are coming back at some point, dead or alive, from Iraq. They have been deeply, severely traumatized. Who wants to summarize what the plan is of, uh, say, the – the Veterans Administration or any other unit of the American military or American civilian entities to rehumanize them so that they can be good civilized people when they're released. What do we have stacked up? How much money are we willing to spend for this? You got it. Nada. Zip. Niente. So that's, that's violent for you. Sorry I'm losing it here. I'm getting out of control. But uh, what we were saying, I guess, Matt, is that the belief that I'm unwilling to relinquish is that it would be possible whether they've been like somewhat dehumanized like our soldiers in Iraq right now. And incidentally, there's a good documentary about that too. It's called Ground Truth by Patricia Fulcrod. Very good. I mean good in the sense that it's true and right on, not good in the sense that it's inspiring uplifting or tells you anything about nonviolence. Um, but even when people have, b have been systematically dehumanized, which has been going on since the Mau Mau insurrections in Kenya, you force people to do things that just completely dehumanize them so they can – you can use their dehumanization against somebody else, not realizing that you've paid a human cost and it's going to rebound on you. 
Um, I would say, and I have no way to prove it, that there's no such thing as eradicating that spark of human empathy and compassion in a person. And there are many very interesting anecdotes of how it can be reawakened in people. In fact, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in other places right now, they're trying out very, very interesting post-conflict mechanisms to get people who utterly cannot trust each other anymore because you know, they were next door neighbors and the next thing you know they were slaughtering. They get to get them back together so they can reach out to one another. Now I'll be participating in something like that in Bosnia and Herzegovina sometime in September where dehumanization maybe wasn't quite so bad and it's a lot of time has gone by. Okay. So I knew I shouldn't have had that uh, chai <laughs> before I came here. I just completely can't stop myself. Anybody have any questions <laughs> before I <laughs> stop me before I lecture again? <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, let's say like a soldier like you know, after a tragic mass occurred. Uh-huh. Who where should the blame go? Where should the blame go? Well, you know, I have a good way to get out of that question <laughs> and I think I'm gonna use it. <laughs> and that is that you know, uh PNV people, you know, principled nonviolence folks, we don't uh, spend a lot of time blaming because it's not really a moral issue with us. In fact, in your reader – thank you for reminding me. Remember your reader? You paid good money for it. Might as well use it. Uh, there is an article by Jack Duvall and Peter Ackerman on the color revolutions in Eastern Europe. Excellent article. Uh, we're going to talk about it next week. But at one point you will see that he says that uh, nonviolence is not a moral issue. It is simply strategic. Okay, th this is an interesting debate that's going on in the field. You know, all seven of us have been talking about it for weeks. Uh, Except really it's a debate that isn't going on in the field. I keep emailing these people and saying, shouldn't we be talking about this? And they, they either say no or they talk about something else. And they have all the money, so you know, this is not going to happen. Anyway, the point is this. The, the strategic nonviolent camp at the moment is setting up a polarity between moral and practical. And which is where they talk about strategies. So in order to be practical, you don't want to be moral is what they're saying. And therefore, they don't want to talk to us because they characterize us as coming on with some kind of moral framework. Whereas what for us – and you can document this very well from Gandhi, Immanuel Kant, uh, I don't know, characters from Star Trek have been known to say things like this. In reality, there is no difference between what is moral and what is pragmatically effective. That's why the work versus work thing becomes so important because strategically you might gain something in the short run but you'll end up paying much more in the long run. So how practical is that? Did you want to? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. 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 This is a very, very good point, uh, which I'm embarrassed to say it never occurred to me <laughs> before now. But the uh, split in Western Civ uh, that starts somewhere in the, in the high renaissance between religion and science has given us these hopeless dichotomies. And that split never happened in India. Uh, if you, you read, for example, uh, there's an a, a Indian text on linguistics which I spent a lot of time studying for 
reasons that are not particularly pertinent here. But I was very struck by the fact that the first line of this it's – in, it's in verse, it's a poem – on linguistics. So you might think it's a very scientific document that's going to talk about, you know, phonemics and where the tongue articulates with the hard palate and stuff. But the first line actually is, anadhi nidhanam brahma shabda tattvam yadakshara. See? <laughs> Which means, see, the tapping? Which means the supreme reality is without beginning and without end, and it is this reality alone that is the essence of all linguistic sound. So can you imagine getting up in front of, let's say, the American Linguistics Association? And starting off with some kind of an invocation of the supreme reality, uh, I think you'd probably lose your license, whatever kind you have. And I think that's a very, a very pertinent observation that because in India science and religion were not two distinct things, the problem never came up for Gandhi. So what we're really talking about is not morality versus pragmatism, but the underlying invisible forces that determine in the long run what will really be practical. John? Yeah. Okay. See, here's the difficulty. If you start from practical strategies with this shallow notion of what's practical, eventually you lose the means ends contiguity. And you say, okay, we got to go for – forget about the quality of the means. We'll use anything necessary to get to that. Yeah. Start from this, what I consider a mistake, and you will get to this mistake. Okay. Anything else? I want to say one more thing, sort of a general overview sort of thing about the Iranian uprising, and then we'll move on to some of the others. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Oh, that's too bad. It was such a nice, clean blackboard. Um, in discussing the Iranian Revolution in the, the book, they make a very interesting, uh, rather somber point. And that is that in a way this was even worse than what we've already seen about the Philippine uprising. Namely, in the Philippine uprising, people power uprising, you had a really successful overthrow, installation of what should have been a perfectly decent government, and the next thing you know it's sliding back into the same old economic disaster or worse for the poor people. Well, in Iran it was even worse than that because you went immediately from a successful nonviolent revolution to a brutally repressive regime. The Ayatollah simply replaced one kind of fanatical ideology with another. And there was, a, there was an immediate tip over there. And this is – you know, if you want to go back further in history, you could say, well, I was going to talk about the Russian Revolution, but that was never nonviolent in any way, shape or form. But here you had the, the Ayatollah from Paris, and this is – darn it, this is another complicated problem is when you have people in the diaspora telling you what to do. It's like you may have noticed in the descriptions of the first intifada that one of the things that the Palestinians on the ground had to do was distance themselves from the PLO. Because the PLO was off there in Morocco, it was maybe some of them were still hanging on in Lebanon. But they'd been out of the country for 25 years. They didn't know what was going on. And it's very easy to sit there in Paris and say, sacrifice yourselves. Uh, it's not quite the same thing as being there. Anyway, here he is calling on these people to make the supreme sacrifice and never resort to weapons. So from our point of view, that looks like an extremely stage three emergency nonviolent uprising. Sorry it got so bad, but there's nasty countries out there doing nasty things. We can't help it. So it looks like a perfectly 
I was going to say perfectly reasonable. That would – that sort of doesn't fit. <laughs> it looks like the right call given these horrible circumstances. The almost immediate defection from nonviolence, the minute it succeeds, tells us two things. It tells us that it could not have been that nonviolent under the surface when you really look at what was going on and what it was based on. And then you begin to realize that a lot of this, you know, never fire back and let yourself be killed was partly tying into Islamic ideology and not into uh, more balanced concepts of self-sacrifice. So it couldn't have been nonviolent. If it were, we would have had a better result from it. Secondly, it shows us – and I've made this point in a little booklet called Steps of Nonviolence, which I really would like people to buy because I'm trying to get it off the shelf so we can use hope or, hope or terror instead so that uh, Carrie and I can become rich and famous. <laughs> um, what it shows us is that the moment of victory can be extremely dangerous for nonviolent movements. You remember Gandhi's famous quip when things started falling apart for him and people were not nonviolent anymore. They were just grabbing for power. He said, well, you know, I was on the train to Rishikesh and they got off in Delhi. Rishikesh being the place where all the sages have meditated from time immemorial and Delhi being the government. You know, so it looks like you're on the same train, but some people get off at a much earlier stop. And incidentally, that happened here in the free speech movement. There were some people who were in it for a complete nonviolent spiritual revolution. Never mind who was in it for that reason. <laughs> And there are some people because they were in it because they hated the administration of the U of University of California, Berkeley and wanted to make them feel bad. So up to a point, you're doing exactly the same thing and then suddenly there's this very awkward split. And this happened in Germany in the uh, 80s a great deal when the Greens Party was trying to assert itself. You have this split between the Fundis and the Realas. It's been a bane of the peace movement. All along in our era. Now, another thing uh, we could use to characterize this is to say that the Iranian Revolution was a superb example of obstructive program. Given their horrific circumstances, given the fact that they had no time to do the training, you know, they could not s ask for David Hartso to come over there and give them nonviolence workshops. First of all, he would not have been let into the country. Second of all, there was no time. They're plunged into it. They did obstructive program. Given their circumstances, they did it terrific. You know, we're going to stand here, go ahead and shoot us. And they shoot until they reach the point where they cannot repeat the experiment and then you win. Okay. But what was missing? Well, first of all, what, what I've already mentioned, the, the deep cultivation of nonviolence was not really there. Could not have been. But what was missing was constructive program. And at the end uh, or by the end of this semester, we'll be talking about several movements that we will see have terrific constructive program and no obstructive program. And one of those movements is the largest social movement possibly in the world today, the movement of landless workers in Brazil. Uh, 50,000 families have been given land. Uh, like a million and a half people belong to this movement. They're translating my book into Portuguese. I mean, it's just sweet <laughs> from so many points of view. <laughs> but I'm going to show you a clip from a film a documentary made about them called uh, Strong Roots. It will show when these people are attacked by the police, by the paramilitaries, by the thugs who've been hired by the people who own the latifundios and have been seriously attacked. They don't know what to do. They throw rocks at them. So I think weak violence is probably worse than strong violence <laughs> or certainly worse than nonviolence. So 
We'll, we'll discuss all of this in greater detail, but I just want to say that as a way of comparing movements, you could look at this as a great trajectory where we have OP without CP and we have CP without OP. This is going on in the world. The result of this is that by the today, a thousand workers, landless people, have been killed by these paramilitaries and police and so forth. And I maintain that if they had, if they knew how to deal with conflict, probably maybe 10 people would have been killed, something like that. And then it would have stopped, just to put, pick some numbers out of thin air here. So wouldn't it be wonderful, and this is where all of this leads, wouldn't this be wonderful if we had a movement that combined CP and OP, that had constructive program and had obstructive program, and knew when to use which? In other words, you had some strategic leadership. I venture to say, I know I'm venturing to say a lot here today. Must have been partly that chai latte that I had. Uh, I venture to say that a movement like that would be just about unbeatable under any circumstances. That's my claim. You can hold me to that. Now, we did have one which was darn close, and that was the first intifada. And we were talking about that a bit last time. Remember you had those chickens in the cages? You want to remember <laughs> constructive program in the Intifada? That's a nice image. <laughs> chickens – don't show it to the people in Pita. <laughs> Poor caged chickens. They, they'd have a problem with this. But I don't want to go there <laughs> right now. Uh, clandestine schools on up to the point where, quote, every woman becomes every child's mother. You have a real – Fusion of the society, there was very little assassination of uh, collaborators at that point in time. And you had people inventing their entire infrastructure. Excellent Swadeshi, very good constructive program. On the other hand, and we haven't had a chance to talk about this in detail, they had very good obstructive program also. They knew how to do it, they had the courage and so forth. If you want an iconic story here too, uh, this story comes from uh, my friend Mubarak Awad who set up an office in Ramallah called the Center for Study the Palestinian Nonviolence, something like that. Don't even know what I'm saying. And his notion was that he was just going to have a library there and people who wanted to learn about nonviolence, they would come and they would read Gene Sharp. Somebody like that. He didn't know about Nagler yet. He'd read Gene Sharp, maybe discuss a few things over coffee, and then they would go out and do it. So he launched – I'll tell you several stories actually if you will indulge me. He launched this movement with a big meeting. He say called a meeting. He printed posters in Hebrew, Arabic, and English saying we're going to talk about nonviolent resistance to the occupation. Fully anticipating two things. Nobody would come and he'd get arrested. Instead, what happened was 300 people crammed into this little space that he had and, and he was not arrested. So he starts this thing and he's been up and running for a few weeks when a farmer comes in and says, I need nonviolence. You know, give me le'uf, which is uh, the Arabic word they were using for nonviolence at that point. It's as bad as the English word, so I'm not terribly happy with it, but that's what he said. So Mubarak said, "Ah, oh, okay, you know, here, sit down here. Here's the books. You know, start reading them." And he said, "No, I want nonviolence. They're stealing my land now. We've got to get out there and stop them." And then the Mubarak said, "Ah, uh, 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 I'm a psychologist. I don't, I don't know how to do this." You know. yeah. But there you go. You know, you're launched. So he got together a group of Palestinians and Israelis. Said, "Okay, we have three rules here. We're going to work together. We're going to eat together." which is a very big deal in the Middle East. You sit down and eat together. You're practically blood relations and no throwing stones. Okay, because this is – you remember in the film this reference to throwing stones being a part of the Intifada. And I want to discuss that with you for just a second later. So this they went out and did, and it was a successful event. They actually forced the settlers to give back the land, this farmer's land, and then that thing was really launched. 
Now at a, at a later point, this is my, th my third story, uh, there was a, a, a kid. He was a part of what they call in the Middle East, he was one of the Shabab. The Shabab are youth from about 16 to 22. They're notoriously difficult to control. They're not easy to control in the U.S. either. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but at least in the U.S. they don't throw stones. They just do drive-by shootings and things like that. Anyway, what's happening over and over again, and the people from Berlin will probably mention this, it happens over and over. You have a demonstration. It's very peaceful, very nonviolent. Then, uh-oh, here come the Shabab. Da -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, -dum, dum They come riding over the hill. They start throwing stones at the Israelis who are sitting there in heavy armor, you know, with face masks and everything. And they immediately shoot back with rubber bullets and tear gas, and that's the end of the demonstration. You know, one of my students was on one of these demonstrations. He was running away and he forgot his mantra. It was so scary. Anyway, uh, uh, this kid is out there at a street corner and there's a regular IDF patrol going by in a jeep. And he throws a stone at the jeep. He hits an IDF soldier. And by the way, in the course of this whole uprising then and now, one IDF soldier has actually lost an eye because of a stone. So. It's not like we're talking about only purely symbolic violence here. Um, and the soldier, who did not lose his eye, <laughs> jumps out of the jeep, chases this kid, catches him, beats him up very badly, and they go on about their business. What happens the next morning? Anybody want to guess? I'll give you a hint. It's like the story of the uh, demonstration in Tehran. Here's our same kid. Limping up to the street corner, there goes the jeep. <laughs> he lobs a stone. Probably doesn't hit the soldier this time. Again, the soldier jumps out of the jeep. Again, he chases him up the street. Of course, he catches him. It's a lot easier now. Beats him up again. Okay. Morning number three. Anybody want to guess what happened? Okay. Here's our kid. <laughs> Hunkering over to the street corner, the jeep comes. He lobs the stone ineffectually. Soldier gets out. He starts to run. Okay, now, now for, for an A, what happens this time? He didn't stop running, actually. The soldier – but that's close, John. You're on the right track. That's like A minus. <laughs> uh, the soldier caught him. And gave him a big hug. At which point the kid marched into Mubarak's office and said, What's going on here? Why did he hug me? This is infuriating. He's supposed to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you gotta you gotta love these kids. And uh, Mubarak said he hugged you because he's human. You know, and you, you reached a point where he was not able to repeat the experiment. So that's an iconic story for this confrontation. Let's do this. Let's talk about why this might not be an ideal example of the kind of marriage that I'm talking about between obstructive and constructive. Let's talk about the question of the stones. And then finally, let's get back to at least two things in the uh, film, the documentary that I wanted to outline. Okay? So here's this uh, intifada which in one important sense it has both obstructive and constructive. They have curfews. They're not smoking Israeli cigarettes. So this is like a form of uh, boycott. It's also a form of indigenous health care. Uh, they've got schools, milk delivery, everything CP. They've got pretty darn good OP. The first intifada results in, although you can't totally see the connections, it undoubtedly results in Oslo and the peace process, which is eventually going to be sabotaged and not get anywhere and you're back to the same old, same old. In fact, I have a very dear friend, a former student who is Israeli and has <laughs> never in her life did she imagine that she would not end up living in Israel. But she's back there right now visiting her family. And she's telling us that for the first time she thinks she cannot live in that country. That's how bad things are. 
So one of two things is going to happen here. Either we're going to prove that nonviolence doesn't work, Nagler doesn't know what he's talking about, this whole thing is bunk, or we're going to say, yeah, this was – it had both but was still somewhat short of the ideal combination. I sure hope it's going to be the latter. What might have been less than perfect in this uh, combination here? What might have been a missing ingredient? This is a subtle point. This is not like a dumb question that I asked you last week. Yeah, Michael? Okay, so let me rephrase what you're saying in my own terms. I get to do that. <laughs> the obstructive program wasn't perfect because you had the stones issue. So let's talk about that for a minute. Here comes this you know, jeep full of IDF soldiers. They've got armor on. The U.S. government is paying $3 million a day to keep them supplied. And you're just a kid. You've got nothing but a stone. So you throw the stone. What does that mean? There is an argument that this is not violence and there's an argument that it is. Okay, Paolo? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're answering both and I, I think those answers are both correct and that leads us nowhere basically. <laughs> it's an interesting dilemma. It is on one level, the intention of throwing the stone is not so much to injure as to show that you are not afraid. It's, you called it defiance and that's exactly the right term for it. So to the extent that you're not doing it in order to hurt, though I'm, I guarantee you most of these Shabaab would be real happy if they could take out an Israeli with one of these things. But let's say that part of them is doing it not to hurt but to show you can't frighten us and this isn't your land just because you come by here in a jeep. As far as that goes, it's courage. And as far as that goes, it's darn close to nonviolence. On the other hand – yeah, Catherine? This is the problem. If they had more weapons, there's no guarantee that they wouldn't use them. It would be one thing if, if they marched up to the street corner, threw down their Kalashnikov – and here's the ideal solution. Step out in the street in front of the Jeep and say, go ahead, hit me. That would be ideal. Say, this is, this is the real world, however. So they probably would have used weapons if they had them and that, that vitiates the nonviolence a little bit. Matthias and then Amy. Yes, it's rage. We want to get back – I want to be sure we have time to discuss that. Yeah, I, I like rage actually. <laughs> Amy? Yeah, you know I, I, I never have thought of this connection before but uh, Eid al-Fitr, this Arabic um, – this Muslim festival. I think I've got the right festival. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, it's, it's in uh, Mecca. You go past this pillar which represents Iblis, the devil, and you throw stones at it. And throughout antiquity, stones – I mean since antiquity, stone throwing has been used as a way of punishing people who are so polluted that you cannot touch them. So stoning – you know this from the Old Testament – stoning means ridding yourself of an abomination. So what do we learn from this? We learn once again – phew, Nagler was exactly correct – that using symbols to the extent that this is symbolic of my defiance, right? Using symbols is tricky because the symbols have different interpretations. Okay, okay so let's see. I think. To come back to our main track here that uh, Michael was starting us off on, the obstructive program was somewhat 
flawed. We're not saying these people were not courageous. We are saying they were not under complete control. There was no Gandhi there to say, what? You're throwing stones? The movement is over. Right? There's no chowri chowra happening here. It's, it's, it's like in Seattle. You have these little small b block of anarchists. They ruined it for everybody. So that's slightly flawed. I would say the constructive program was flawed slightly by the fact that they were just doing it to stay alive. They had no awareness that, hey, we can build our own culture and it can be beautiful and it can be like, uh, uh, like heaven here. It can be uh, utopia. They had, they had no such a concept. They just wanted eggs. And you know, who's blaming them? You know, they had to stay alive. I'm not saying they did the wrong thing. But if you look at the constructive program in the movement of landless workers, they said, we're going to start with a com completely clean slate. We're going to have a new kind of education, a new kind of politics, a new kind of economy. We're going to go in for organics because we're part of the 21st century. It's just beautiful what they were doing there. Okay, so I hope you are all convinced that uh, nonviolence still works. <laughs> and uh, we can show that even though this they had OP and CP, which is probably absolutely essential, they didn't have somebody coordinating it, looking at the whole thing and saying, here's when we use this one, here's when we use that one, and here's why. Okay? Alex. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Again, this is a very important point. I have it underlined here in red ink on my notes, which I haven't gotten to yet. But uh, there's a concept that we take from Central America and, and South America, which may even have. I even have touched on last semester firmesa permanente, which means you know, unwavering firmness. It means once you decide that something has got to be stopped, you know, this must be fought, and that you're going to use the right means to fight it, that you're just going to keep on doing it until you can't go anymore. Um, and very often it is the case – oh boy, are we running out of time. Very often it is the case that people who are doing something nonviolent feel that they should not be injured because they're doing the right thing. And heck, I mean, if this is a perfect world, like if we were God and we organized the world, the people who did nonviolence would not get hurt. But unfortunately, that's not in our job description. So what is going to happen when a movement meets with unexpected resistance? Two different unfortunate results can ensue from that. You can have this climactic breakdown. And the classic example of that is the Sharpeville Massacre, as it's called, in South Africa. I think it's 1962. I'm very, very bad on dates. Um, but it, an uh, unarmed demonstration was fired upon by the uh, police and something like 56 or 60 people were killed. And at that point, the ANC, African National Congress, which had been going full tilt in favor of nonviolence, went right back to violence. They said – and you'll have uh, statements by Mandela saying that we wanted to be nonviolent in South Africa, but it didn't work because the opposition was too powerful. So that's why the first essay in your reader last semester was Nonviolence and the Case of the Extremely Ruthless Opponent. Do you have it in there again this semester? Okay, anyway, so that's a climactic breakdown of discipline, but the thing that happens more frequently is wearing down through time, attrition. Just attrition. You get sick and tired. Look, we've been doing this for X number of years. We haven't gotten anywhere. 
we're hemorrhaging for money, we're losing blood, we're losing everything, we can't go on with this. It doesn't work, we go back to violence. So that's what happened in the case of the Intifada, at least for a lot of people. But uh, it look at the Jallianwalabagh massacre uh, in India, 1916. Um, 400 people were killed, 432 people. And they, they didn't stop for a second. There was just practically nobody who said, oh, we didn't realize that we were actually going to get hurt. So, and I don't mean to sound sarcastic about this. I mean, who can blame these people? Here they are. You know, you, you looks like if you go on with this, you're going to get killed. I'm not going to sit in judgment on anyone and say they shouldn't have stopped. But all I'm saying is if they don't stop, the results are eventually going to be extremely positive. So the Intifada was a bit betrayed by forces on the international arena. I'm not mentioning any countries, but I think you can guess which ones I'm hinting at. Um, and it was, it was worn down by attrition. Uh, and these are, these are reasons why the good result was not as permanent as we might have wished. Okay, we have two more minutes according to my little timepiece here. And I wanted to pick out two things from the documentary, both in connection with the um, Chilean movement. <coughs> Uh, one of them is important, the other one is super important. Okay, the important one is, do you remember our friend picking up the phone and saying, this was a clandestine movement? Well, again, this clashes with some of the squeaky clean theory that we learned in A, which is devotion to truth means that you never tell a lie. You always, you're always out in public. and. We have cases of people actually doing this contrary to expectations. We have Daniel Trachme that we learned about on Tuesday, I think, last week, where he said, okay, so I don't care that the Nazis are in charge here. I will never tell a lie. As a Christian, I simply can't do that. Somehow the guy managed to survive miraculously. Um, and there are other examples, too, of the incredible protective power that this strangely brings with it. But no one in the movement, neither the strategic folks nor the principled folks like me are going to say, the minute you start a movement, you've got to telegraph the, s the FBI and give them the names of all the people who came to the meeting and say, here's where we're going to be next Tuesday and stuff like that. Th this is the real world. The other th and I want to discuss that with you a little bit next time. Uh, and I'll bring up – you remind me, Matthias, there's a case of a – German Catholic priest from southern Germany who has a very interesting argument about this. So just remind me about him. The th super important thing is this. This woman who lost her son in Santiago, in Chile, she says – and I wish we could hear the Spanish here. Maybe you could help us, Paolo, because I would really like to know exactly what words she used. So Paolo and Nubia get together and figure out what she said. She said, I was not angry, I was enraged, right? And because of that rage, I felt I had to act. Furio. Furio. I think you could almost hear that, furiosa. Not enojada or something like that, but furiosa. Okay. This is – might just seem like a little play on words. You're saying, oh, there's Nagler. He's a comparative literature scholar. He's, there he goes again. But actually, I think that this is critical. So let's talk about that a little bit.